Hi, this is uh, Rob Furman with my colleague and friend Keith Reeves, and uh, we are the Seditionists. And um, we have an, an honor coming up here in December, 6th through the 8th, we're going to be at VISTI, Virginia Society of Technology, of Edu uh, Te of Technology and Education, uh, their conference uh, in Roanoke, Virginia. And we're going to be doing a, a live session of the Seditionists there on Sunday, I believe that's December 6th at 2.45. So, if you're a Virginia Knight and you want to come see a live show, uh, please come on out. We're also going to ask for some uh, audience input on some of our topics, so it should be a pretty fun session. Uh, today I would like to talk about the uh, mental health industry and uh, the help or lack thereof when it comes to public education. Um, public education seems like, at least in, in, in my respect, um, that it's a failed system, that, that we're not able to connect parents and kids with the proper groups. Uh, the groups that are out there uh, need these parent permissions and they're not getting them. So it's sort of this system of we can see the writing on the wall very early being an elementary principal. I'm talking very early, but yet it seems like nothing can ever be done to really get a satisfying, helpful situation for these kids. And I'd really like to hear Keith's take on this because um, He's, he's, uh, this is near and dear to his heart as well, I know. Keith. It's true, and I think the key there is failed system. Um, as I often talk about when things turn toward what we can and cannot do, um, we professional educators in concert with the service providers that know child psychology, child development, and have mental health intervention skills are frequently stymied from directly influencing where we can do the most good for a variety of factors, not the least of which is non-educator control. We have legislated away much of our ability to influence situations where we have the necessary training and skill to intervene with kids. And we see this all the time. We see legislators and pundits and people who really have absolutely no business telling any educator what you know, is appropriate in a situation with a child. What we should do, what we can do, things like that. We end up with situations in which we're now catering to not even the lowest common denominator, but the non-denominator. We're just removing our ability to, to make these choices that may be best for the kid. Now, it's not to say that I don't understand why some of the advocacy frameworks are in place. I don't object to IDIEA in principle, and for those who are watching who aren't into education, Rob, and I know all too well the federal education law that uh, governs special ed. I understand that there is a framework for advocacy for every individual kid. I don't have a problem with that. But our inability to control situations, and as somebody who speaks a lot against control, I don't want to be misunderstood on this point, we have the ability to influence in a way that um, we're not allowed to exercise because of the way the system is structured. I think failed system is exactly right, Rob. So let me ask you a question, uh, Keith. <clears throat> let's, let's play a hypothetical here. Okay. Um, we know there's been some a lot of tragedy in the world uh, with... Uh, school shootings and, yeah. and violence and those type of things and um, I, I am not one that's going to skirt skirt the issue and I know you're not either I think a lot of that uh, has to fall on the shoulders of educators so that we can uh, teach learn and uh, help those kids early on um, so it had, the responsibility to fix those type of problems falls squarely on our shoulders as well okay. um, as well as you know the parents and everybody else but hypothetical um, let's say there's a child has violent tendencies, um, maybe has an IEP, which would be an individualized education plan, which is part of the uh, special ed services that Keith was talking about. And um, maybe the teachers are screaming at the top of their lungs, this kid needs mental health. We, we need to help him. There are experts out there that can and will, but we are not it. Um, and then you get, a, let's say, a set of parents that say, no, my kid's fine. Yeah. We got an apple tree situation here, so I'm sure, you know, the mental health issues run, run, run deep. But what do you do in a situation where your hands are tied, you've got parents that probably shouldn't be making these decisions, and then you've got laws that are protecting everybody but, but the general ed child. I mean, the child yeah. who basically uh, is just there on a normal average day. What are, yeah. what are your thoughts on that? 
Well, I'm gonna, I made a couple of notes, so I'll try to work quickly. Let's first talk about the ideal, and then we'll work back to the realistic. The ideal, of course, we have to hit on at least one thing you said, which is we have to have more influence over this. A professional educator has an ability to be objective and professional to help a child in a way that no parent can. And I write, there's a whole chapter in my book dedicated to this. I don't fault parents, and I, I, try, I, I try to say this as clear as I can. I don't indict parents for, being, for not being objective. They can't be objective. We don't want parents to be objective. We want them to be biased toward loving their child completely and that that's all they want and they only see the good in their t I get that. But we have to have, if we're going to have a society in which we bring children together from disparate walks of life into the same space, and, and we're going to say we as a society can help them, we have to have some ability to say to certain, and a minority though it may be, a certain type of or subset of parents and say, I'm sorry, that's not what's best for your kid. I know that you think so, but between Rob and I, we've been to college seven times, eight times, and we have all of the professional back. We know what we're talking about here, man. And we're naturally driven to love children and do what's right for them. And I'm sorry, what you're describing is not okay. And we're not going to do that. We don't have that ability at the moment. So solving that problem would be a huge part of it. I think that there are two categories that we have to approach both in the ideal and in the realistic. Problems we can control and problems that we create. There are circumstances for many kids in which we try to cram them into schooling that doesn't make sense for them. They're hyperstimulated by audio. Then why are we putting them in a general ed population with 30 kids where they're yelling and screaming other people? Uh, we have students who don't learn well sitting down. Why are we putting them in a situation with block classes in 90 minutes? Those things we can control and can make exceptions to within the context of the system as it exists. And in my idealized system and in our revolutionized system, we would do away with many of those structures altogether. Things that we can influence, things that we, uh, those are the problems we create, right? Like we create those problems through traditional schooling. Problems that we can control if the child is having a, a serious crisis in the system that we have now, and the parent is intransigent, right? One of the things that I want for schools to do is let things go to due process. We abandon due process all the time. We do everything we can to prevent things from going to the state. Dude, let them sue us. If I recall correctly, the statistics are roughly three to one, that 75% or so of the time, these due process at levels at the state, at least, I think it was in Virginia, find in favor of the school because we're professionals and we know what we're talking about. Let them sue us. And if a court order says, you know, this is we're going to do what the parent wants in this situation. Well, okay then. Now that we've been forced to have some, some accord there. But if we know we're right, if in a situation you and I say, dude, it's so obvious what this kid needs, and there's a disagreement, let it go to due process. We have a system of jurisprudence that allows us to fix that. It's not politically feasible, uh, uh, desirable, but I don't care about that. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, the uh, the due process is something that I think uh, both politically and financially districts shy away from, and okay. that's probably one of the most frustrating things in, pro in, in all of education is the fact that we make more decisions based on money than we do what's good for children. Right. Which, I mean, I understand you have to do that to some extent because you only have so much money to play with, but that drives me insane. That, that they're always more concerned about saving face and saving money than they are saving kids. Agreed. And that's always a, a huge, huge fear of mine. Um, well, this was a great conversation. I, I wanted to um, finish up with, with uh, a challenge, if, if you will. Um, Keith, one thing that always frustrates me, and this is m more than just education even, um, is why don't we fix the simple thing? <laughs> um, for example, uh, this is unrelated to education, but for example, um, drunk driving. Let's just take drunk driving for instance. Um, my cell phone can do more technological things that just blow our minds. Isn't that true? I mean, technology is just insane. Sure. And you can't possibly tell me that for minimal money, we couldn't put a little sensor somewhere in a car that says, if I detect alcohol in the air, this car is not going to turn on. <laughs> Pretty simple stuff, I would think. Um, especially when the, the things that my phone can do, you can't tell me that's not possible. So why don't we do those simple things to save lives? Well, it boils down to money. You All of a sudden, you know, you don't have to have car accidents, you're not going to have hospital bills, you're not going to have insurance and all those type of things. Make a long story short, there's a lot of simple things out there that could be fixed that people just simply don't. Um, my challenge is this. 
I would like you and I and our listeners to find just one simple fix that we could do in education, and then I would like to uh, blog that experience from the idea's inception to what we want to try to fix through how many channels we may have to go and see where what we'd have to do to actually get it fixed until hopefully we could actually get it fixed and see how long that whole process would take or if it's even possible. So what I'm, the, the first stage would be you, myself, our listeners would have to come up with that one thing that we think would be a pretty obvious fix. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, for, for example, um, in an IEP or in, in IDEIA, going back to special education, you know, it, it, it says that a child with an IEP can bring a knife to school that's under three inches in length. Now, there's contradicting policies there because if you have a weapons policy, you can't suspend the kid right. and you can't expel them. So that might not be what I'm, you know, but that's the idea. Finding something, just one point that we could say, okay, we don't really think this makes sense. Can we try to logically fix this problem? What are your thoughts on that? I think it's an interesting idea. Um, as somebody who spends a lot of time in the theoretical um, and in the revolutionized, particularly having based on the last work, um, I'm now trying to pivot. I'm working on book two here, finishing it up on um, the paperless research paper model I've developed. I, I like the idea of spending some time living in the practical sphere and seeing what can we implement from these ideas that we both share in the immediate. I think it's kind of a cool idea. Um, I'd be hard pressed to pick just one, but you're going to make me distill it down. And I like that. That's That'll be a, uh, an additional challenge to the challenge. Uh, but I think it's a great idea. And it directly invites those who are watching to participate in these conversations. Um, I think that's a great idea. I'd like to do that. Okay, audience, you heard it. The seditionists here are going to try to take our words and put them into action. So what we need from you is a list. What do you see as logical changes in the world of education that we could eventually narrow down to one and then try to try to make it an, an ultimate change. Uh, there's a lot of talk out there. Everybody can talk, but if, unless we don't actually put action to it, then we're all just doing nothing but blowing hot air. So, you know, the seditionists, uh, Keith, Day, uh, Keith Reeves and myself, we, we uh, offer to you to uh, take the, the talk and let's go for the revolution now and make make a change. We're just going to start with one. Uh, so thank you, Keith. I'll let you cl uh, close it up, buddy. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. As Rob mentioned, um, we're going to be speaking together on Sunday, December 6th at the Hotel Roanoke in Roanoke, Virginia for the VISTI conference. Um, we've got a couple of other things going on individually. We're doing a book signing together for our two books. Rob, congratulations on the PASCD award. Thank you. Very, very proud. Um, we're going to be doing a joint book signing at 315 on Sunday at the Hotel Roanoke. Look for signs. Um, as always, you can follow Rob and I on Twitter, and we look forward to having that conversation in the comments section. See you guys next episode.